Greetings everyone, welcome to Sonic & Knuckles Mega Madness, the continuation of a story that began in Sonic issue 39. So why make a special rather than continue straight on with issue 40? If I were to guess, it's probably a business decision. Seeing this awesome cover featuring a robotic Sonic and a robotic Knuckles would grab fans' attention. Hey, it got mine. Anyway, let's recap what's happened so far. After Sonic's plan to get himself roboticized for good got rejected, he was kidnapped and roboticized for evil. He wasted no time destroying Knothole Village. Not even Bunny and Knuckles could stop him. So Sally's ready to enact Operation Last Resort. Said operation involves Rotor running off to get something while Antoine gets Knuckles ready. Mecha Sonic continues burning down the village, but all he's doing is destroying empty houses. The village was evacuated ahead of time thanks to Sally. Rhoda returns with... Wait a second. Is that... Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. A portable roboticizer. The very one that partially roboticized Bunny way back in issue 3. Since then, Rotor's been working on it, and according to him, it's operational. After a brief discussion on the morality of using such a device, Knuckles wakes up. Mecha Sonic must have really knocked him around hard because he's seeing things. Namely, Antoine as Mecha Sonic and Rotor as Robotnik. One kick from Sally's all it takes to snap him out of it. So hooray for violent solutions! Apparently the two have history, and while it's nice to learn more, there's a killer robot on the loose. Knuckles takes a Neuro Overrider and hops straight into the Roboticizer, without hearing the risks. That's either brave of you, Knuckles, or that's a boneheaded move. You decide, folks. During the village attack, Mecha Sonic spots Tails. The fox flies off while Mecha Sonic tries to lock onto him. Keyword, tries. It seems there's still a bit of Sonic in there. Robotnik detected the hesitation and decides to nuke Knothole himself. All he needs is the coordinates. Uh, Robotnik, does it matter if you have the coordinates? Nuking the Great Forest would cause some nasty fallout in the area. And why didn't you ask Mecha Sonic for the coordinates earlier? Well, I can let that slide since you were on Cloud 9 when roboticizing Sonic. You weren't thinking straight. It doesn't matter as the newly roboticized Knuckles, or Mecha Knuckles, interrupts the transmission in his own way. The fight begins, and as the Freedom Fighters point out, Mecha Knuckles has a slight advantage due to being freshly made and keeping his free will, compared to the battle-worn enslaved Mecha Sonic. Yeah, Mecha Knuckles is definitely paying back all that nastiness Mecha Sonic gave him while he was organic. Mecha Sonic has one final trick. An uppercut that sends Mecha Knuckles straight into Robotropolis' nukes. But Mecha Knuckles hates traveling alone, so he uses the energy in his claws to drag Mecha Sonic along for the ride. And both reach the nukes. The Freedom Fighters assume the worst. Robotnik survives the blast by hiding underground. The midsection of Robotropolis, however, yeah. It's a miracle Robotnik's not poisoned by the radiation or toxins. He's probably built up an immunity by now. Robotnik's not the only survivor. He salvages the damaged Mecha Sonic before getting knocked back by a damaged Mecha Knuckles. Before the robots leave, Mecha Knuckles explained to Robotnik how he came to be, and we learned Mecha Sonic turned himself into the blast, taking the full brunt. Upon returning to Nonhole Village, or what's left of the village, Mecha Knuckles is on the verge of burnout. So Tails escorts him back to the portable roboticizer to turn him back to normal. I'll talk about that later. Though I will credit the story this, they don't stick the worst off Mecha Sonic in the portable roboticizer because only those roboticized by the portable unit can have the process reversed. Which is a problem since everyone discovers Sonic's still in there. Thankfully, Nicole might have a possible solution. It basically involves the time Sonic went on a weird journey in issue 35 after collecting his one billionth ring. When he returned, he gained a magical protective aura, or as I like to call it, enhanced Sega plot armor. While it did not prevent Sonic from turning into a robot, it kept Sonic's essence intact, so all they have to do is hook Sonic up to some machinery and trigger the plot armor. That'll restore Sonic to normal because... magic. Unfortunately, any equipment Rotor could use was destroyed in the attack, and they cannot scrap something up in time. Nicole offers herself as the solution. She has the data and the power to trigger the plot armor. Some might have a problem with this contrivance, I do not. I'll get more into it in my comments. Anyway, Nicole activates the plot armor, which does its job in turning Sonic the Hedgehog back to normal. 
just in time, as we see Knuckles back to his old self as well. Sonic does not remember his time as a robot and acts like a complete jerk to Knuckles, whom immediately bails. After Sally points out Knuckles saved all their lives, Antoine slapped the cuffs on Sonic. For disobeying their orders and getting himself roboticized, Sonic will stand trial. Yeah, we know what really happened, but they don't. But that's a story for another time. There are two backup stories in this special, so let's go through them quickly. The first backup story, Don't Let the Island Hit You on the Way Down, features the Chaotix under attack by four individuals, Predator Hawk, Sergeant Simeon, Flying Frog, and Lightning Lynx. They gather the defeated Chaotix in one spot, only it's revealed they were playing possum and get the jump on their attackers. Another player enters the fight and smacks around the Chaotix. This large fellow here is Mammoth Mogul, the self-proclaimed once and future Lord of Mobius. The once part is elaborated here. Eons ago, he was a hunter that stumbled upon a green rock that granted him almost limitless power, and used that power to rule. But the various races evolved enough to gain strength and independence and dethroned him. So he spent the millennia doing various things. And the aforementioned green rock? It's a Chaos Emerald. This was back when the Chaos Emeralds were in the thousands, but still hard to find. Plus, all of them were green. This leads to the future part of his title. While he has one, his plan is to get the Floating Island's Chaos Emeralds to increase his power and rule Mobius. After dealing with Robotnik, of course. This is how the Chaotix respond. Apparently, after that one punch, Mogul and his goons make a strategic withdrawal and will return at the right time. The Chaotix will be ready for them. Uh, yeah, sure. The last story is called Eel of Fortune, and it stars these guys, the 40 Fathom Freedom Fighters. If you're only familiar with post-reboot content, then wouldn't you believe that in the old universe, there are animals that look more like their real-world counterparts and have the intelligence and speech of the average Mobian? Well, this underwater crew qualifies. The story begins with PB Jellyfish, yeah, I know, running into the fleeing Octobot. The reason he's fleeing is because of a new underwater player, Eel Capone. That's kind of embarrassing. A robotic machine running away from an underwater mob boss? What's next? Having Octobot be the lower half of a Badnik hybrid with, say, Crockbot? Anyway, Eel Capone shows he means business by sicking mollusks on PB. Later, PB comes around in front of Ray and Bivalve. They need to stop Eel Capone's plans for the sea. Unfortunately, their best ally, Fluke, is migrating, but someone else shows up to help, Bottlenose, who is a Finja warrior. Yeah. In no time flat, he finds Eel Capone and defeats him. So, that's a special. Let's tackle the backup stories first. The one featuring the Chaotix is merely a setup story. It introduces some new villains, and they retreat because the timing wasn't right. Mammoth Mogul, I assume, is supposed to be an XP of DC's Vandal Savage, a caveman that was exposed to radiation from a glowing rock and became immortal. Now, Mogul says he's powerful. Later stories prove this to be true, but here... You're not making a good first impression, buddy. Likewise, the fearsome foursome's just muscle. This is their first appearance, alongside with Mogul, and like Mogul, we'll get to see some development from them somewhere down the line. The art's done by Harvey, a frequent inker of Spaz's artwork. And he should stick with that. Seriously, the art's a bit subpar. Overall, this story gets a 6. Again, it sets up things to come, and we learn some minor Mobius history. The second backup story? What can I say? After the seriousness of the first two stories, children needed some fun in the book. But to me, this story is definitely the pun-filled goofiness you'd expect from Mike Gallagher with the Dave Manic art to match. Which is why I'm going to give it a score of 5. It's harmless fluff, but I'm in no hurry to return to this story. Now for our real story. There are some plot elements people might have a problem with that I do not mind. First, the horrible roboticizer. It would make sense to salvage it after rescuing Bunny. After all, they could learn more about the robotization process and try to reverse the effects. The reason they haven't used it until now? Rotor did say he was repairing it. Now, even a genius like Rotor, and possibly Tails, would not know everything about Robotnik technology, and he might have recently fixed it enough to get it working. 
I mean, look at this thing. It looks pretty terrible, doesn't it? This could also explain why they didn't use it in issue 29 and why Sonic didn't use it in issue 39. But they did here because the situation was that desperate. It was called Operation Last Resort, after all. Oh, and there's that moral issue, but in combat situations like this one, pragmatism is the way to go. Even if the machine was online, there was a risk. Perhaps Rotor's repairs were not sufficient enough. Maybe the neural override could malfunction. So many things could have gone wrong. Luckily for Knuckles, they didn't. This leads to the unit having a de-robotization feature. Well, they had to get Knuckles back to normal quickly. He was badly damaged, plus Robotropolis was recently nuked. So going there is out of the question. If Robotnik incorporated it into the design, dumb move on his part. But he's based on a Saturday morning cartoon villain. As I said earlier, I'm all for why the worse off Mechasonic couldn't use it. It was a compatibility issue. But since this is the same unit that turned Bunny into a cyborg, why can't they reverse the process on her? Again, refer to my earlier spiel about Rotor repairing the damaged unit and the risks involved. Even if Bunny saw the situation as unpleasant, would she risk death to return to normal? Plus, as you saw in issue 39, there are benefits to having cyborg enhancements. And for a real-world explanation, it was to maintain some sort of status quo because her sad AM counterpart was a cyborg throughout the series. Speaking of status quo, Sonic returning to normal using Nicole and the enhanced Sega plot armor. Some see it as deus ex machina, and they might be right. But there was enough setup to make it look like it was not pulled out of thin air. Sonic's freaky journey in issue 35 was the result of the Ancient Walkers, powerful godlike beings for the record, wanting to reward him for collecting his one billionth ring. The enhanced plot armor made an appearance at the end of that story, but Sonic assumed it's because he was holding on to the one billionth ring. He didn't realize the power was in him all along. Or maybe the ring transferred the power into Sonic or something. The plot armor allowed bits of Sonic to come through during the story, which meant Robotnik's brain burned through technology was complete garbage. As for Nicole being the one to trigger the change, remember, she's from the future, or possible future, established in the In Your Face special which means she would have more than enough technology required to initiate the process, if they follow the real-world application of ongoing technological advancement. In addition, Future Rotor could have programmed or wrote a directive for Nicole to help Sonic when the Mecha Madness thing occurred because he remembers that horrific event, but do it in such a way as to not reveal future stuff which could explain her odd behavior in the story. As for the story itself, it's basically another Sonic vs. Knuckles fight. Only this time, it's a brainwashed hero fighting another hero. Having them be robots is just an awesome bonus. I thought nothing could top the time they had a super fight, but no, this one's better. It's hard to believe Mike Gallagher also wrote this story because this was a different tone than Eel of Fortune. Either he's capable of making Sonic a little more serious at times, or there was an uncredited rewrite somewhere. Spaz's art still impresses me. He kept some things consistent like the damage Bunny received in issue 39, and he made the portable roboticizer look like it was from a junkyard, which helps support the theories I've talked about earlier. My score for this story is a 9. It's a great action piece with great art and some minor world building with the Sally Knuckles talk. I added one point for the following reason. Not everything's wrapped up in a nice, neat package. Sonic has to face the consequences. It may seem unfair to us, but from the Freedom Fighter's point of view, after what happened in issue 29, I don't blame them for taking such extremes. Later this year, I'll take a look at Sonic's Court Martial, which takes place in issue 40. So until then, have a good day, and be safe. Ah, there's nothing like using an Italian song to immortalize your victory over an eel, eh, Bottlenose?